Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. For the second straight day, New Jersey is shattering all records of new confirmed coronavirus cases higher than the peak this spring. More than 5,600 reported today by the Department of Health, putting the nine-month total at more than 356,000. Although testing was being done on a much smaller scale back in April and May, the numbers are still enough to put the state on track for our highest seven-day total of the outbreak. 48 new confirmed deaths were announced, more than 17,000 total fatalities. Nationally, the U.S. is not on any better footing. President-elect Joe Biden said publicly he plans to ask all Americans to wear a mask for the first 100 days of his administration to reduce the spread of COVID. Meanwhile, the state is preparing for the first round of vaccines to be delivered. Governor Murphy expects them to be shipped within 24 hours of the government's emergency approval. Today, signing an executive order to make the vaccination process easier to track, changing the state immunization information system from an opt-in to an opt-out program for any resident who wants the vaccine. But it doesn't force anyone in to being inoculated. The light on the other side of this pandemic is, is real. It is now becoming visible, and this is a game changer. To be clear, the mere presence of a vaccine in our state does not mean that we can flip a light switch and remove all restrictions or lift every advisory. COVID is, isn't going to simply vanish just because there are vaccine doses in a freezer waiting for distribution. This is going to be more like a dimmer and the light will get brighter and brighter and brighter over time. To get to full brightness, Governor Murphy says it'll take months and millions of residents getting vaccinated. Until then, the administration is preparing for the peak of this second wave, predicted by experts to hit in just weeks. With more than 3,300 patients being hospitalized for the virus, medical systems are bracing for an influx. But a new state model released today by the Department of Health shows the situation may not be as severe as first anticipated. Is it realistic? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Governor Murphy's expressed some optimism that a new moderate state model shows daily COVID cases peaking at about 5,400 in Jersey by mid-December. But the state topped that with 5,600 cases today. In fact, the moderate model assumes a minor spike after Thanksgiving, significant social distancing, everyone wearing masks, and no super spreader events, which sounds almost unrealistically rosy. We're trying to be as realistic and as accurate as possible as it relates to everything, including with models. Behavior can change the model. The model is dynamic. It is not static. The state's got about 7,800 hospital beds available and a spring peak of about 8,000 COVID patients pushed the system to its limits. New Jersey's new moderate model now projects second surge hospitalizations will peak at almost 5,000 around January 1st. But a different model from IHME shows a far more dire forecast, a January 14th peak of almost 9,500 patients needing hospital beds. The fewer people in the hospital, the less pressure and less risk of infection on our hardworking and heroic healthcare workers, and we need every single one of them. COVID outbreaks have been reported amongst about 100 staffers at Ocean Medical Center in Brick and up to 40 at Palisades Medical Center in North Bergen, both operated by Hackensack Meridian Health. Earlier this week, administrators posted a since deleted memo stating the larger outbreak occurred after several of our colleagues socialized outside of work and then unknowingly exposed both other colleagues and patients to COVID-19. But a healthcare worker union rep objected. We know hospitals were super spreaders. 
I mean, they're full of COVID. So how outrageous is it to say this came in from the community when we know COVID exists within the facilities and that our workers are taking care of these patients routinely? It's up to the employer to say, well, we know for sure that these workers got COVID in the community and brought it into work. Otherwise, it's a workplace exposure. It just is. Hackensack's chief physician executive says about 1% of its 36,000 member workforce has tested positive. He wouldn't provide further details. But Daniel Varga explained how COVID's spreading amongst workers at the hospitals. The source of infection that, that, we, that we day in and day out are dealing with is the fact that our people, our team members, uh, are exposed to people in the community and come to work asymptomatically positive. It's presumed you got it because you went to work. Attorney Paul DaCosta says Governor Murphy signed a law stating that when an essential worker contracts COVID, it's legally assumed that happened on the job. He says that makes workers' compensation claims pretty open and shut. If you go to work at the hospital and contract COVID, you are presumed to have contracted it on the job. It doesn't matter if it was treating the patient, if it was walking through the cafeteria, it doesn't matter if you got COVID from the guy who handed you your coffee at the coffee shop. Hackensack Meridian said in a statement that it complies with all laws of the state of New Jersey and stands with Governor Murphy as we have since day one of the pandemic in doing whatever it takes to keep our frontline workers safe. We're strictly adhering to all CDC and New Jersey state protocols to ensure the safety of our patients and our team members. The governor said he wants hospitals to provide more data on staff COVID infections to post on the state's COVID data website. I want the the healthcare providers, the hospital systems, to be very clear and upfront about what's going on uh, in their hospitals. They continue to say that it was outside transmission in. I think people need to see more detail to, to have the confidence uh, in that. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. The 10-day lockdown put in place by Newark Mayor Raz Baraka is scheduled to end today. It asked residents to stay at home starting the day before Thanksgiving to help slow the spread of the virus. COVID-19 has been ravaging the state's largest city. As of today, nearly 17,000 confirmed cases there. As senior correspondent David Cruz reports, Baraka is calling out anyone who criticized his aggressive actions. It's the double-edged sword of the COVID war, a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, the resulting economic downturn, and mistrust of government, not to mention all the other pre-existing conditions of urban areas. Left with the responsibility to make it all work out is Mayor Ras Baraka, who instituted a 10-day lockdown on people and businesses in reaction to COVID's raging through his city. Folks here were not having it. I think that is outrageous, you know? Like, I don't understand it. Like, it's been going on for mad long. Like, why? Like, why now? Like, just give us more money. That's all we want. We don't want no lockdown. They say, oh, why well, Newark doing that? Newark has a lot of nerve. Well, you get the authority. I mean, so a reporter called and said, where do y'all get the authority to do this from? I mean, it's pretty bizarre. That's Baraka on his regular Facebook COVID update, expressing his annoyance at questions about whether he could do what he was doing. Others said Baraka was going beyond the governor's slightly more forgiving executive order. It's a grayish area that the governor and mayor have agreed to live in because Baraka makes the point that other states and cities across the country, like L.A., which just announced a three-week lockdown, are being way more strict. In Newark, we had 280,000 people with a test positivity rate of 16 percent, of 16 percent. Right. Almost three times that of 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 uh, uh, of uh, L.A. County. Right. And and so. We have an a 10 day lockdown and L.A. County has a three week lockdown. I just wanted you to contemplate that. So when you think the mayor is doing something too rough or too hard or too crazy for you, just contemplate what's going on around the country. I think it's a good idea. I think that people should stay inside and. Um, hunker down with their families and get to know them better. Right now it's a good time so that we can stop the spread. The CEO of the city's major hospital says his staff and facility are getting stretched to their limits. 
So he supports the mayor's efforts, which he notes are mostly targeted to several zip codes where the test positivity rate is closer to 40%. I think his leadership has been great. I think uh, if we continue to see cases rise and a particular hospitalizations rise, wouldn't be surprised if he took more restrictions uh, in addition to the governor. The mayor's office announced that the lockdown scheduled to end today did the job of slowing the spread, although it provided no evidence of that. The mayor did issue guidelines for holiday season activities, but for now at least, no new mandates. I'm David Cruz and Jay Spotlight News. After managing to get through the spring relatively unscathed, Camden County Jail is now reporting 39 inmates and 75 staff members have tested positive for the coronavirus. Those cases were confirmed through the fall. According to a county spokesperson, none resulted in fatalities or hospitalizations as of today. Infected inmates have been cohorted or separated from the rest of the jail, which houses more than 800 inmates. Visitations are on hold as part of the safety guidelines. All jail residents are getting care from the facility's medical provider. At roughly 20,000, Camden County has among the highest rate of confirmed coronavirus cases in the state. On Twitter today, President Trump emphatically asked Republicans to, quote, get tough, while again calling the election rigged. The president has pressed on with his allegations of ballot tampering and foreign interference in the election, despite members of his own administration debunking those theories. How is that playing among his party? Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron goes on the record with Carl Golden, former press secretary to Governors Tom Kane and Christy Whitman, about Trump, President-elect Biden, and the issues dominating New Jersey. Carl Golden, thanks for joining us. I wonder if you think that Donald Trump, by saying that the election is rigged and that he actually won, is hurting himself politically around the country. Absolutely. I don't know if you saw his, his rant last night for 45 minutes or so. Uh, it was borderline demented, uh, just ranting about how the election was stolen from him, that uh, votes were cast, uh, millions of votes cast illegally, uh, foreign interference with the machines, that somehow somebody in Eastern Europe got control of the voting machines. And every time someone voted for Trump, it went to Biden. Uh, it was an incredible performance that uh, I've never seen anything like it before, and I'm sure that people who watched it never seen anything like it before. And I, I really do think he's hurting himself. He's going to leave in January. He, he has not been reelected. As difficult as it may be for him to accept, Joe Biden is the president. I'll get the president-elect at the moment, but we'll be in January. Uh, look, you know, I've been in a lot of campaigns, Michael. Losing is hard, okay? But, you know, there's no silver medals in this business. You win or you lose. And, you know, Oh, he lost, refuses to accept it. He has people who are as, as cranked up about this as he is uh, with wild conspiracy theories and totally implausible scenarios. Um, if he intends to have a future in the party, and I don't know if he intends that or not, uh, he is certainly not helping himself with the rank and file in the party. I think the party leaders, the party establishment have had about enough of this. So he's not really in control of the Republican Party at the moment? Well, he, he's in control to the extent that he's still the president and will be for another, what, six weeks or whatever. Uh, but once that six weeks is up and once he vacates the White House, presumably he'll do it voluntarily, uh, he may try to take control of the party. Uh, he's raised a lot of money already, as I understand it. I may try to take control of the party, but if the party wants to survive, it cannot allow him to do that. Let's talk about Joe Biden. He has rolled out maybe half of his team so far, national security, economic team, uh, communications team. What is what, what do you make of what he's put forward so far? Well, I think it reflects the way he's going to govern, which is center to center left. He's been a centrist and a moderate for the entire 47 years he spent in, in public office, a Senate and a White House. Uh, he's uh, run into some difficulty with the far left in his party, the so-called stealth-style progressives who are unhappy with some of the uh, uh, appointments he's made and the nominations he intends to submit. 
Uh, but, uh, and, he, and he's going to have to deal with that. Those folks are not going to go away, uh, but he's going to have to uh, deal with, these are my nominees, these are my cabinet people. They're people who, with whom he's had a relationship, a prior relationship for many years. Some came from the Obama White House, uh, where he's obviously had a relationship with them. But I think he is, he is building an administration that will govern from the center and maybe a bit to the left, which is what he said he was going to do, which is what his entire history has been. No one should be surprised by any of this. Carl Golden, good to talk to you as always. Michael, a pleasure. Thank you. And President-elect Joe Biden's victory appears to be reigniting the conversation over immigration reform. Now U.S. Senators Bob Menendez and Cory Booker are speaking out against county contracts with ICE. The state has agreements between the government agency in Hudson, Bergen, and Essex County jails to house detained immigrants while they await their deportation cases. ICE pays the counties more than $100 a day to hold detainees. The senator's call comes just days after activists protested Hudson County's decision to renew an agreement with the agency for 10 years. Both senators slammed the contract, saying no private or government entity should accept money in exchange for locking up individuals. Well, cash is tight for a lot of communities right now, especially on Main Street. But an NJ Spotlight News analysis shows more than 140,000 New Jersey businesses benefited from nearly $16 billion in federal emergency loans through the Paycheck Protection Program. The relief aid was billed as a way to keep small businesses from going under. Problem is, editor-at-large Colleen O'Day's investigation found businesses with fewer than 25 employees got just 37 percent of the loans. Colleen joins me now with the latest in her reporting. Colleen, this was touted as really the way to keep our small businesses intact, but what did you find? So, you know, small businesses did get some money, but it was clear that more of the, the larger, what is still deemed a small business got um, the lion's share, more than 80 uh, percent. Many of those are companies with 500 employees. That, that was the cap for the size of a business that could get money. And we had about 17 that got the full 10 million, which was the maximum amount that you could get from this. What do we know and what did you find in your analysis about which of these companies really benefited the most and where were they located in the state? Um, so, you know, medical offices got um, the most money, and that would presumably make sense. Um, lawyers were second, which was really kind of surprising. Um, restaurants got money to save the most number of jobs, uh, but certainly not the most amount of money. Newark and Edison, which, you know, are both real hubs for business, uh, is where the most money came in and the most businesses, you know, did best. 34,000 businesses in Newark and about 31,000 in Edison. And those kept, you know, thousands and thousands of people on the payroll, which was really important during the, you know, the tough economic downturn we've had. Colleen, was it just that some of these larger businesses, more of them were applying for the federal loans than these smaller, the mom and pop shops? Um, or is it that they were actually just granted more of the pot of money? So what we found, especially in the first rollout, because there was a second round of this, was that the larger businesses were better connected. They already had um, relationships with banks or they were working with lawyers who could help them um, with this or accountants. And the, the truly small businesses really didn't, you know, have an edge. It's kind of like, you know, buying tickets when, uh, for me, a Springsteen concert would go on sale. You know, if you know how to, if you're already logged in and you can try to, you know, get those tickets faster than somebody else. Hitting that refresh button doesn't work for the PPE program. Colleen O'Day, great analysis. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brianna. The latest monthly jobs report shows New Jersey and the rest of the country trending in the wrong direction. Rhonda Schaffler has details and today's top business stories. Rhonda. 
Brianna, we got another reminder today about just how much the economy is being impacted from the spike in coronavirus cases nationwide. The government's monthly jobs report showed a sharp slowdown in job growth, basically reaffirming what we saw in a few other reports this week. In November, the U.S. economy created only 245,000 new jobs, down sharply from October's pace when more than 600,000 new jobs were added. Governor Murphy today signed a bill that expands the eligibility for unemployed workers in New Jersey to collect 20 weeks of extended unemployment benefits. As we've previously reported, this will help those workers who have exhausted both their state and federal benefits. More than half of the new jobs last month were in the warehouse and transportation industries as more of us shift our buying to online. New Jersey is benefiting from that. Home Depot has announced plans to open a distribution and fulfillment center in Perth Amboy next year. The company wants to bring on up to 400 workers to staff the new facilities and is already hiring for the positions. Republican state senators are pushing for more emergency financial relief for New Jersey small businesses and nonprofits impacted by COVID-19. Senator Declan O'Scanlan has put forward a bill that would provide an additional $300 million in assistance. We do have money. Uh, we've gotten out now a substantial amount of the CARES Act money, although I'm not sure it's in people's hands, but it certainly is in two department hands. Um, but we also have a, a massive surplus growing every day, some of which could easily be easily uh, be devoted to saving some of these businesses. Republican members of the Senate Budget Committee say they want small business relief to be included in any new state tax incentive bill. They're expecting the legislature's Democratic majority may soon advance a bill to reestablish a tax credit program for businesses and corporations. Now here's a look at Friday's trading action on Wall Street. I'm Rhonda Schapler and those are your top business stories. This weekend, join Rhonda Schaffler for NJ Business Beat. She's focusing on the state's tourism industry and why businesses and lawmakers are optimistic the state will bounce back next year. Watch it on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Well, no matter what's happening in our lives, many of us rely on the holiday traditions that come around this time of year. But even those are taking a back seat to COVID. Pictures on Santa's lap, in person, town tree lightings, and large services at your synagogue, those are all off the table during the pandemic. This week, the State Department of Health released guidance on how to safely celebrate the winter holidays. What can we expect? Leia Mishkin reports. There's over 5 million lights and displays outside. This holiday train ride is a tradition at the Didonato Family Fun Center in Hamilton. Only this year, it's the COVID friendly edition. We disinfect everything after each family. Each family has their own train car. Um, Santa's workshop is equipped with air soap, which kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. Christina DiDonato Dillon says her grandfather bought the bowling center back in 1952 with his brother. My pop op is going to be 90 and he is still here every morning. And my dad unofficially was in the business from the time he was born. So when I had my babies, um, I came back here um, full time and I'm so happy to be with them. Things have been running smoothly, but just this week they got word of more changes on the way. Effective 6 a.m. Monday, December 7th. And until further notice, the gathering limit for all outdoor activities will be no more than 25 individuals. This family business survived a fire in 1966, a COVID-19 lockdown of 127 days. So this news is a challenge they aren't afraid to face. We will have crews working through the night and all day Monday to reopen as a drive through event. It's been a team effort to, you know, make a map, make sure that every display is right. We're building a stage for Santa and Mrs. Claus and the elves 
themselves so that everybody can see them. My two kids are our test subjects, my two and three year old. So we make sure everything is Luke and Mina approved before it goes out to the public. The holiday season will be different all over the state. New Jersey Department of Health released new guidelines for winter celebrations. Making the list. Christmas tree and or menorah lighting events should be held outdoors and must adhere to gathering limits. It is strongly recommended that people consider alternatives to visiting Santa at indoor locations. Children should not be permitted to sit on Santa's lap. Parade participants should not be permitted to throw items from their floats or cars to spectators. All singing groups should be socially distanced from each other and their audience during each performance. We're very thrilled that we made that decision because that's how things have turned out. The executive director of Princeton Symphony Orchestra is referring to the call his team made late this summer to record their holiday concert in early fall when cases were more under control. We wanted to as much as possible bring people together in person because uh, of course while we were making those recordings there were also opportunities for small informal audiences to form around so we were able to bring little pockets of music to the town while we were doing that. The silver lining of taping instead of their usual live event, the 10 virtual broadcasts are gaining an even bigger audience without any capacity or geographical limitations. I think that this is something that our whole organization can be extremely proud of. COVID-19 forcing everyone to stay flexible and think more creatively to share the spirit of this holiday season. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. And if you missed any of the big stories this week, you can catch Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. on NJTV, along with Chatbox that airs Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. And that does it for us this week. Head over to njspotlightnews.org where we'll continue to cover the stories affecting the Garden State all weekend long. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. Have a safe and wonderful weekend. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than a hundred years. PSE&G, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.